Gospel of the Lord, you know. Sometimes we take out freedoms for our, we, take, we don't take advantage of our freedoms like we should. And while we have the freedom to worship openly in public, lift our voices to God, let us take advantage of that because we, there may come a day when we don't have that opportunity or that advantage to do. But we're going to get ready for Sunday school, so let's just bow our eyes and prepare our hearts for service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and shall continue to do. Lord, we thank you that you're God who reigns on high and that there's none like you, Lord. Even right now, we rebuke every attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you sit your angels at the four corners of the property, above and below, that no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and our minds will be good soil for your word to fall, Lord, that we may remember it throughout the week. But even greater than that, that we would apply it to our lives, that we may be transformed into the very image of Jesus Christ. Anoint the minds and the lips of all the Sunday school teachers this morning and the ministers, Lord, that they may bring forth your word and may do it in a way that is understandable, Lord, to those listening, that they may grasp it and attain it and apply it to their lives. Lord, we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Brother Eli, you want to collect the Sunday school offering? Sister so and so. 
Assume that's in your life for no other reason, but they're that close to God. May we desire to be that close to God, to have an ear with Him. We begin talking about faith, because everything in life requires faith. Accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and the fact that His Word is true takes faith. The fact that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. That takes faith. Do you remember what the enemy of faith is? It's doubt. We love to use the example of Jesus coming off the wilderness and rebuking the disciples for not praying and fasting. But before he even mentioned to them about praying and fasting, the reason he said that that demon didn't come out was, you doubt it. Then we moved on to talking about prayer. Prayer is one of the most unutilized weapons in the Christian arsenal. And we went around the church world today and actually had a prayer meeting. How many people would actually be able to pray versus those that came in and maybe prayed for five minutes and didn't know what to do or say after that? But prayer is one of the most unused weapons in the Christian arsenal, yet it's one of the most powerful. But Christians today don't really know what it is to pray. C. H. Spurgeon said, "Faith oblivious." Uh, let me move on. That's not what I wanted. Raven Hill said, "A man who is intimate with God is not intimidated by man. Why? Because he has the ear of God. He knows what it is to pray. And when it comes to prayer, Jesus expected us to pray. Nowhere in the Scriptures will you find that when Jesus said." if you pray, but rather it's when you pray. Or after this manner, pray ye. Nowhere in there does it indicate that it's an option for the Christian, but it's something that Christ expects us to do. Now today we're going to move on and we're going to be talking about fasting. And if there's a lot of people who do not know what it is to pray in the church, more likely there's a lot of people who don't know what it is to fast in the church. Why is that? Because prayer takes commitment. It really does. And it's not always fun. But fasting goes a step farther. You can sit down and read your daily devotions. Maybe you read your Bible passage for that day and it takes what? A matter of five, ten minutes. But when it comes to fast, fasting is something, doing something that none of us really like to do. And that is sacrifice. We talked about the other week about the person who chip up um, cheeks. When we're going to go into a fast, what, we, what do we do about five minutes till midnight the night before? We stuff our cheeks as full, full of food and down as much as we can because we know we're not going to have anything to eat for a meal tomorrow, whether it's breakfast, whether it's the whole day. Fasting places us in submission to God. Andrew Murray said this, Prayer is reaching out after the unseen. Fasting is letting go of all that is seen and temporal. Fasting helps express, deepen, confirm the resolution that we are ready to sacrifice anything. Even ourselves to attain what we seek for the kingdom of God. Psalm chapter 35 verse 13 states this, But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled my soul with fasting, and my, and my prayer returned my, into my own bosom. Fasting is a step beyond prayer. If we had to sit down and look at the book of Acts and compare the Christian church back then to the Christian church today, we would probably find that there are two lost arts in the Christian world. And those are that of prayer and fasting. It's hard to find a church that has a prayer meeting anymore, much less that is open on a Sunday night. It's getting fewer and fewer. Why? Because people are giving in more to the flesh and they want to give in to their own desires more than they do really to discover things of God. But for the individual who really wants to seek God, who really wants to know Him, they're going to pray. And they're going to fast. Why? Because where there is no prayer, 
there is no power. And where there is no fasting, there is no self-control. When we are walking this Christian walk, it's not a matter of pride. It's not a matter of, matter of me, myself, and I. How do we do, know that? We have a biblical example. There's someone in the Bible who thought that he could go above God. Who thought that he should be in a location, in a place setting, higher than God. I will ascend him in the hill of the Lord. I will set my throne above his. I will do this. There's seven I wills that Lucifer had. And what happened to him? God gave him the boot. And he got cast down to the earth. And the Bible is clear on why he got kicked out of heaven. What rose up in his heart? Pride. Iniquity. He thought that his way was best. When we come to fasting, fasting places us in submission to God because it is us putting down the flesh. It is us not having self-control over ourselves, over, or we're not allowing self to have control of this body. We're not allowing the carnal to have control. When that stomach tells you that it's time to eat, no, it's not. We are getting close to God today. So what is fasting? Fasting, according to what Mary Webster's online dictionary is this, eating sparingly or abstaining from foods. Now, if we look at it in the Hebrew and the Greek, according to the, from the words taken from the Bible for fasting, in the Hebrew it is used in, as used in Isaiah 58 is soa, T-S-O-W-M, and I may not be pronouncing that right, but regardless, it means this. To put your hand over your mouth. When you put your hand over your mouth, there's not much going through there. So when we look at fasting, it's abstaining. And in the Greek, it means exactly that. Abstaining from something, normally food. Abstaining. Doing away from. Staying away from. Not going after the cookie in the cookie jar. Not going after the last fudge round in the cabinet. Although I would say that if I had never did that accidentally, I would be lying. There were times when you're fasting and you take, go in and you take a bite and say, oh no, I was fasting today, I forgot. Why? Because this flesh takes over. Fasting is putting down the flesh, subduing the flesh. When we look at the fasting passages in the Bible, they're found in Isaiah chapter 58 and also Matthew chapter 4. In Matthew chapter 4, you look at and study the example of Jesus in the wilderness. He fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And fasting is powerful because it shows God that we are serious. When we look at figure, historical figures on fasting and prayer, we know that Mary, Queen of Scots, said this, I fear the prayers of John Knox more than all the armies in England. Why would she fear the prayers of John Knox? Is it because he was simply just praying during that time? I highly doubt it. I'm sure he was fasting and making himself right with God, getting himself into a place of prominence with God. When we, there's a story told of a landowner who had this man come to him and offer him a certain price for his land. He said, no, that's too low. A little bit later, whether it was days, weeks, I don't remember exactly how it goes, the same man comes back and said, I have a buyer. Once again, you reject his price of this, we are now offering you a lower price. Man refused. Man came back with a third price for the gentleman, saying, this is what my buyers are willing to pay for this land now. And as he was getting ready to go, the landowner asked him, well, who's the buyer that you're representing? He goes, John Knox. He goes, well, then you know what? I'll take it for that price because I know John Knox prays. God's got to give him that land for free. How do individuals get into such a prominent place of power? It's not just by prayer, although prayer is part of it, but it's a place of fasting as well. Because when we fast, we show God that we're serious with him. 
J.G. Morrison said this, Every great leader who moved his age mightily fasted. The Apostle Paul, who was a man of special miracles, signs, and wonders, and who affected his generation mightily, was in fasting often. Taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27. Epiphanes, an ancient author, wrote this. Who does not know that the fast of the fourth and sixth days of the week, our Wednesdays and Fridays, are observed by Christians throughout the world? So even way back then, several hundred years after the apostles, it was given that the church world was going to fast and pray every Wednesday and every Friday. You didn't have to tell it. You didn't have to announce it from the pulpit that we're fasting this week and Friday, or on Wednesday and Friday and praying on those days. They knew it. Every Christian knew it and it was expected. John Wesley also followed this pattern in his personal life and encouraged pioneering Methodists to, do, Methodists to do the same. He once said, while we were at Oxford, the rule of every Methodist was to fast every Wednesday and Friday in the year in imitation of the primitive church. So even during the time of John Wesley, you didn't have to get up from the pulpit and announce that we're going to pray and fast this Wednesday and Friday from here on out. It was expected. You knew what to do. Kind of like when you're alarm God. You knew you had to get up out of bed, this, that. It was part of the norm. Nobody had to tell you to do it. You knew it was there. It was expected. When we look at Jonathan Edwards, a revivalist in the colonial days of New England, he gave himself to regular seasons of fasting and prayer. In fact, his most famous sermon in the hand of an angry God, God was delivered following an all-night prayer meeting. So when it comes to having effectiveness and power of God, it's not just a matter of prayer, but we need a fast as well. We need to place this old flesh under submission that the carnal man might be weakened and the spiritual man strengthened. How are we going to do that? We do it by prayer, but we also do it by fasting. What is the purpose of fasting? Part of the purpose of fasting is to bring your dependency back to God. What does 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9 read? 2 Corinthians 12, 9. If someone else would find Matthew chapter 19 and verse 26. 19, 26. But whoever has 2 Corinthians 12, 9, go ahead and read that. Paul would gladly, gladly rather glory in his infirmities than the power of God might rest upon them. So part of the purpose of fasting is to bring back our dependency upon God. What about Matthew 19, 26? With men this is impossible, with, but with God all things are possible. You know, we have limitations. There are situations that sometimes accrue not always of our own doing, but because of someone else's actions. Maybe something out of the way just drastically happens. Deer jumped out, totaled the car, and you don't have any way to pay for it. We need to realize that our dependency is upon God. We are never going to enter through the gates of heaven unless we realize that it is our dependency upon God. Even for those who think that they don't need God in this life, even if everything goes perfectly for them, they still need God when it comes to death. Otherwise, they're still never going to enter into heaven. We need to realize our dependency upon God, and that is part of the purpose of fasting. Subduing our will that we may know His will. Other purposes of fasting is to draw closer to God. We know in His work. Draw nigh unto me, and I will draw nigh unto you. 
Blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. We can chase after God in prayer. But for those who have ever fasted, know that there's just something special that when we push ourselves in a time of fasting as well, it, come, it seems like God comes down to meet us more. Because we are taking an extra step farther to meet Him. We may fast to know God's will, as found in Acts chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. And I'll go ahead and read that. Acts chapter 10, 1 through 3. There was a certain man in Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian Band, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision, evidently, the ninth hour of the day, the angel of the Lord coming and saying unto him, King Cornelius. So he was a man who was devout to God and much alms given, and given to God constantly in prayer. He was a man who was seeking after God. He may not have known God as the Jews know him, but he was doing everything that he could to chase after God. Another reason we might fast is to become more power, empowered by the Holy Ghost. Now, when it comes to this aspect of it, this deals with those who are baptized with power, with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, with evidence of speaking out of their tongues. There are there is power that comes with the Word. Don't get it wrong. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. We can see unsaved people cast out demons. If they do it and use the word of God because it is powerful in itself, it has nothing to do with them. But if we are going to become more empowered, then A, if we don't have the baptism of the Holy Ghost, we need to seek the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence. And for those of us that are baptized with the, with the Holy Ghost and have been, we need to constantly be seeking with a new touch, more power, a greater anointing than ever before. And that will come also in times of fasting. The secret of power and divine direction in the early church was the fact that the fastings accompanied the prayer, the prayers. We find that in Acts chapter 13 and verse 2, and if someone else would find Acts 14, 23. Acts 14, 23. I'll read Acts 13, 2. And they ministered to the Lord and fasted. The Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas, and Saul for the work whereof until I have called them. What about Acts 14 and verse 23? Does someone have that? When they had ordained and held in every church and prayed for fasting, they commanded them to be the Lord on whom they believed. So fasting and prayer went hand in hand, and it gave them more power. Through the power, through the Holy Ghost. If we also look at Matthew chapter 17 and verse 21, yes, we used that earlier about discussing the enemy of faith, which is doubt. But once we get past Jesus coming out of the wilderness after he rebukes the disciples for doubting, he then explains to them in fullness why they couldn't cast out the demon even if they had not doubted. And what did he say to them with this demon? It's in Matthew 17, 21. It's right there in your notes. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. 
Let this mind be in you, which was also in my in Christ Jesus. When we look at this old flesh, there are deformities in it. Paul said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You know, sometimes the devil tries to place, his, place thoughts in there. Sometimes we allow doubt to creep in. Sometimes we have our own uh, thoughts that creep in. Sometimes we look at things and even scripture or spiritual things in a certain light, and that's not how they are at all. But Paul said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? It means we fast to be transformed into the very image of Jesus Christ. What did G, uh, David, the Psalms David write concerning his sin with Bathsheba that we like to quote from the book of Psalms? Create in me a clean heart. And he did stop there. And renew a right spirit within me. You know, we can pray for these things, but if we truly want to see them come to pass, we're going to fast about them as well. And when we fast, it shows that we are serious with God. Serious with God. That we really, really want to change and we need His help. So we want to be, we pray and fast to be transformed by the power of the Holy Ghost. To receive a greater anointing through the power of the Holy Ghost. What does Matthew chapter 17 and verse 21 state? Matthew 17, 21. So we pray and fast to have power over the enemy. When it comes to having power over the enemy, you realize it's not our power, but it's through the power of Christ and the power of God that we overcome them. Let's try and find something real quickly here. We also uh, might fast at the death of a loved one. We find that in 1 Samuel 31, 30, 13. Maybe in repentance, where we uh, sinned and we sinned against God and we're truly, truly sorry. In times of fear, 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 6. I'll go ahead and read that one. Samuel chapter 7 and verse 6. And they gathered together to Mizpah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day and said, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel and Mizpah. So they poured out the water. They fasted because of repentance in times of fear. They were seeking God's forgiveness. We may fast for spiritual guidance. We may fast in times of affliction. We may fast just to show God that we're serious about something that we're praying about, whatever the situation would be. We may fast for deliverance from a disaster like they did in Joel chapter 1 verse 14. When it comes down to it, there are numerous, numerous reasons to fast. But when we fast, it reveals to God that we are serious and we are truly trying to get a hold of Him. We are grabbing a hold of the horns of the altar and we're not letting go until we receive an answer. We are subduing the flesh that we may feed the spiritual. So what do we do when we fast? In Matthew chapter 6, verse 16 through 18, the Bible states this. Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrite of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their face, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. 
But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thy head and wash thy face.